All right, welcome everyone for our next speaker. I'll be introducing Noberto Leite, a principal engineer at Okta. Yeah, something interesting about Norberto is he's been coming to PGConf since uh, Berlin three years consecutively, and now he made it to the stage. So he's going to give us all his wisdom. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you can, you can. Or the, the theme of his talk today will be about the 650 plus Postgres clusters uh, that they manage at Okta in his talk, Identity at Scale, How Okta Uses Postgres. So again, please once again welcome uh, Norberto. So I'm very fortunate to have a second round of applause, so great, thank you guys for that. Um, all right, we, this presentation today is, or this next hour or so, it's all about identity and how you manage identity at scale and how you use our good old friend Postgres to do the job. Uh, Safe Harbor, actually not gonna do any uh, f future claims of all, of it, at, at all, but, uh, Working for a publicly traded company, it's always good to do this. It's basically my authorization to lie. Anyways, my, I'm Norberto, as mentioned before. Uh, I Database is my thing, and sometimes I put them to, on a scale or, or not. What we want to talk about today and show you a little bit how we do things is challenge of scaling identity management systems, operational challenges, service release infrastructure uh, operations, and obviously, uh, how all this boils down into a couple of examples of things that can go wrong at scale or good as well uh, with databases, especially Postgres. In terms of takeaways, I'll uh, give you a little bit of a sense of how complex a uh, login box might be. Folks might not figure out this at first sight. Things that we learn operating in large fleets. It's not just a question of having one big database or one big database with lots of changes. It's having that times 600 plus. Stuff that we like Postgres to have, I won't be finger pointing it, but you're probably gonna have a hint of things that we probably would, uh, would like Postgres to be a little bit more evolved, let's call it. And unsolved challenges, so if you have a good solution for things that we might not have fixed yet, uh, come and talk to me, I'll be happy to chat about it. Anyways, uh, a little bit of a show of hands, Okta, is anyone familiar with Okta? All right, cool. By the way, my boss is, is named uh, Andrew Yu, is one of the co-founders of Postgres. He would like to see that, that all hand. So if you, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take a picture. He's also a, a aficionado on selfies, so I'm gonna make fun of him. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna go in. Uh, raise your hand, please. All right, cool. I'm gonna tell him that I, I asked, who, do you know who Andrew Yu is? And everyone said yes. All right, so. Anyways, Okta, what we do at Okta, what I do at Okta, and some friends of mine are here, so they won't let me lie. Uh, a few years back, Okta bought one of its biggest competitors called Auth0. I was an employee of Auth0. And essentially, we are the SIAM solution for Okta. Okta is an identity management tool or service, and Auth0 is mostly also an identity tool, but mostly focused on customer identity management access or access management. Essentially, if you have a service out there and you want you, all your customers to connect and tell them or validate that they are who they say they are, we probably use Auth0. Auth it's probably something that you probably are familiar. By the way, Auth0, anyone? Yes, okay. Well, more people are out there. That's, that's, that's a new one. Anyways, the folks from Dev Advocacy also asked me to promote this. We are also having an Auth Oktoberfest, or Oktoberfest 2024. If you want to participate and get to know a little bit better how this service works, there's a QR code over there. I might just show it at the end, so you can register and participate in the fun if you want to. I actually don't know what is in there, but I'm pretty sure it's very good. So, the challenge of scaling identity management systems. Um, why is this so complicated, or is it? If you go to our um, documentation page, you immediately see this as the front page of the docs, which probably give you already a hint of a lot of different things that you can do with uh, Auth0. You can uh, authenticate, great, there's different ways of doing that. You can manage users, you can customize your user experience, your authorization flow, your login flow, your logout flow, a lot of different things. 
And obviously, it needs to be secure. You can extend it. You can do a bunch of very nice things with it. I'm pretty sure they're very nice. I'm just a database guy, so I don't even know how this thing works. But there's a bunch of different services that we have to deploy and manage. So they must do something. And if we think about the typical use case is that you have a user, and you have some sort of web property somewhere. And the user tries to log in or access. The, probably what you want to do as a service owner is that, well, hey, who are you? Uh, please show me a way to validate that you are the person you are. So one of the typical things is you, you provide some sort of credentials, like an email, a password, and if those check, they match, you're in. So you're probably going to need uh, some sort of authentication server, either in-house or something like Auth0. If you're using Auth0, you're also going to have something like um, uh, MFA, like uh, multi-factor authentication. Not only you know the password and the credential in the combination of that, but you also have some sort of device or some way other to validate that you are who you say you are. And you probably have some sort of customization, say, hey, uh, this is my picture, this is where I live, and this is, I don't know, uh, things that I like to do. Or you probably also have some sort of notification mechanism that says, oh, OK, uh, you changed your password. Great. Or you logged in this time from this device that we've never seen before. So are you sure you are who you, you are? Uh, whoops, 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 whoops. What did I do? Uh, I'm new at these things. All right, cool. So and you might also want to have something that helps your customers help themselves, like, hey, hey, Watch out, your password that you are inserting here has already been breached before and some other thing, so you might want to do that for your customers as well. And notifications and all that stuff. Don't forget, we don't live in, the, uh, in 2000 or 1999. We don't have just web browser applications. We also have native apps and we have CLIs. All of these probably are provided by you as a service owner to your customers and your users. So you want to authenticate those as well. And you don't have only credentials like uh, email and password. You also have pass keys, and you also have uh, biometrics, and you also have uh, social login, and a bunch of other things that you use to validate that the persons accessing your or coming to your, your website are who, in fact, they say they are. OK, so it's pretty simple, right? We want it to be. We want you to not think about any of this stuff. We want you to just click some boxes and say, hey, you have, we got you covered, and from your user experience, it needs to be as simple and flawless as just the login page that they are very used to it, or not even login at all. No passwords, for example. That's pretty good. So under the hood, there's a bunch of different things. So there's a bunch of different systems we use. We used to be a old MongoDB um, shop back in the day, and slowly we've been adding more complexity to the system because we evolved the number of services that we have and the types of data that we manage. Obviously, we went through the Redis caches. We have Kafka rounds. Obviously, we have Postgres. That's why I'm here. And we also experiment some, with some other things, like Dynamo and some other stuff. Postgres is by far the database that we use the most for the vast majority of different services. It's not the biggest data store that we have, but it's definitely the one that we use for more different things. So a lot of the services that I've shown you before may or may not use Postgres directly. And that leads us to operational challenges. That's all fine and dandy to put as many goodies or many databases into your stack, but you're going to have to operationalize that. You have to actually deploy that. You have to maintain patches. You have to do a bunch of things with it. Uh, there's a nice blog post written by one of our architects about explaining a little bit how we deploy things and how our package everything together and all that, if you want to go and follow that. But from this picture, you can always already see that all the goodies that I was showing you in terms of databases are packaged together, and we deploy a service. And you might say, it's just a login page. Why do you need so many data, different databases? Well, the picture before kind of show you why. There's a bunch of different things that you actually want to do. And as platform complexity increases, new services evolve with new features. Great. Now we have some people that want to do stuff with a particular different index or uh, how these interactions between different services will be modulating a little bit your complexity in maintenance and versioning and infrastructure releases. All that needs to be operationalized. So it's complex. Big picture, we have all these things, and we basically sprinkle databases on top of them, which is nice, right? So it only makes it even harder. 
But the good thing is that we want to have a very strong foundation and for our platform so we can manage this in a much more elegant way. So we have three basic pillars, I would call it. We want to be always cloud native. So any service that we do, anything that we do to provide service to our customers needs to be on a cloud native infrastructure. We basically use Kubernetes for it. We don't want to manage our databases. Uh, I'm a lazy person. Uh, some of the my team members are here. We are all very lazy. But we definitely like to provide a good service, but don't we have to deal with all the uh, underlying systems optimizations. We rely on the best of the breed to do that for us. So DB as a service, we rely on them very, very much. And we want fully isolation. A service should not block or break a full release. We have multiple different uh, multi-single service or microservice architecture here. So we want to make sure that all of these are isolated, tested together and in separate, and they are not breaking each other. So it's really, really important to have these things in mind. We also want to be cloud agnostic. We have some customers that are OK on us deploying on AWS. Some of them are, no, we don't want any of that. Or because of geographical limitations of the service availability of these cloud providers, maybe some have on a jurisdiction that they don't have a data center on, so we need to use one different cloud for that. We also have a cross-cloud or multi-cloud deployments. Why? Because in some geos, we don't have, for example, full failover. We only have one uh, region for a particular provider, but there is a cross-cloud uh, uh, failover region that we can use so we can do the multi-cloud kind of deployment. There are a lot of control operational challenges that we are aware of and we design and build for it. Logging, metrics, internal network configuration, yada, yada, yada. All these stuff are challenges because they require us to do some work and to test and validate things for it. But there's also not so under control operation challenges as well. When a customer gets attacked or when we you know, fat finger something or we do cascading failures that we didn't test for it or we have external providers not providing us the service like Cloudflare being down or AWS being down in a particular region. All these things are not so well programmed, but we still think about those and we still build for that. Our platform needs to be resilient based on that. Again, login has to work. So just a quick example, one of the things that we need to deal with is scaling. Uh, well, what do we do by, about scaling? When you have a platform, you have all these different services, you deploy them in containers, you could deploy them in a Kubernetes cluster, very, very well organized, all of these are stateless, right? So they just instances that run some sort of programming code that does something for your services and the request that you get it. And scaling this is pretty simple, I would say. Some of them with auto-scaling rules, some of them will require more load, some of them will be replying to more requests. So you basically would just adjust the number of pods or capacity for each one of these services independently of each other to adjust to the needs of the customers or the system that is under load. However, we have state. And if you talk, you've probably seen throughout this uh, week that Kubernetes is also a, a in fashion uh, system to deploy your databases. Great. But it's not as databases lose their momentum. It, databases have a problem. They manage state, and state has a lot more density, meaning that they manage a lot more bytes per unit of computation. So we need to be a little bit more careful about not wiping out completely a database. That would not be good. We obviously always do redundancy because that's one of the pillars of any always-on kind of service. We do not want to be prone to a single failure of a given node. So multiple redundancy is also very, very important. And redundancy is not just having a secondary node or a read replica. It's about redundancy of deployment as well. When you deploy, how do you make sure that that doesn't change as the state that you're dealing with? How do you rotate nodes? How do you make sure that you do not being, be affected by an AZ going down? Also, do not forget, redundancy can be at the data level as well, not just the instance level. So backups and point time recovery, all that stuff needs to be attended for and need to have it. Otherwise, you're going to be having a half lagged kind of uh, deployment. All right, so we have your redundant databases. Uh, and thinking, putting ephemeral aside for a second, because yes, they manage state, but by the notion of the ephemeral needs or, or uh, nature of that state, it can go away. You have to be prepared for that to be wiped out if needed. 
So if you think about like stateful, stateful uh, databases, you need to think about what, how do you do to scale these. You always have the option on a cloud deployment to do it vertically, so making your instances bigger. Storage keeps the same, you just put a bigger machine, a more capable machine on top of it. That's proven. But if you group things very well together, or if you are able to compartmentalize your data sets, you can also scale out, which is horizontal scale. So when to do one versus another? So what are the rules to do this? So we always do scale out because that's what's in fashion, or should we never scale out and just always do vertical? We have some rules. We use vertical scaling as our preferred mechanism. It's much easier, easier to operate, easier to automate. Um, it replies very well, sort of, to bursts in terms of load and peak performance. So you can always set up your replica bigger and then flip them and everything goes well. So, but at the end of the day, it's something that we, in an emergency, we always opt for that. So if there's an incident and we are being attacked or something like that, we will give you more capacity. We'll try to block, obviously, the attack sources and whatnot, but before our customers feel the pain of their customers not being able to log in, we'll provision resources, if available, to make sure we can keep up with demands. It might not be an attack. It might be like, I don't know, someone made a promotion online and everyone just went crazy and tried to log in at the same time. We also have rules for horizontal scaling. Uh, manual splitting and logical databases into separate clusters is the first preferred way to do it. So if you have a cluster, multiple different logical databases on it, you probably want to move some of that data aside if you can. We, we w are well aware of uh, Aurora Server li or Limitless and CTOS data, for example, as a auto sharding capabilities. They are great, but sharding within the cluster, you need to apply different rules. Like, for example, you need to apply a sharding key. And once you cho choose a sharding key, if that sharding key is not widely used on all your access patterns, you are going to privilege some instead of others. So you need to think about the consequences for performance once you have a sharded cluster. It's all fine and dandy, but you need to really go in, do some changes at the application level, which for operation folks, we try to prevent that as much as possible. We delay that decision for the product because if we are lazy, they are even lazier. We also group things together based on three major, let's say, uh, uh, characteristics. Service criticality, so if one service is tier one or tier zero for us, meaning that never can, can go down, or if the minimum downtime possible for that is in the order of milliseconds, we're probably gonna package all those together in the same Postgres instance, for example, because if one goes down, everything goes down, so we're probably okay on recovering that and giving it more resources, for example. We probably also want to package together things that have the, the same uh, backup retention policy. Let's say, for example, we have a database that stores logs logs that have a retention policy of a few weeks only. In, 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 on the other hand, we have, I don't know, user profiles that have years of retention policy. I don't want to mix those two together if you'd, I do not have to, because otherwise my backups will be extremely ballooned to make sure that the logs are gonna keep there for years and they take a lot of space. I don't need that, so I'm gonna do a cost-efficient allocation based on that. In data lifecycle, so if they're ephemeral, put it on Redis. If they are not ephemeral, and you don't count the user Redis, and if they are very well persisted, or if they have the same access pattern, like heavy reads and heavy writes, you will do the balancing together, so you can also adjust the capacity you have in your clusters based on that. Really, really important. Horizontal scaling also allows you to do heterogeneous deployments. What does that mean? You're gonna have different sizes of databases and instances laying around. That might sound, for me, as a database guy, a nice thing to have, I will adjust it. But from an operational perspective, that can be complicated because the next time there's an incident, well, this is on a EC2 instance extra large and this one is too extra large. What do I do about them? So SREs and the complexity of the deployment might be changed because of that. So we need to be thinking about that as well. All right, how do we actually do it? When we do need to scale, we do a little bit of both. If we can just scale up, we will. But if we start seeing limits in terms of page contention or access record contention or even some internal processes that actually cause more pain than benefit, we will scale out. And we'll probably start by moving a particular data set that is more critical than others, or one that 
for example, has a lower retention policy, so we save on backup costs, for example. That is something that we do. Or, for example, if there's a particular service that, if it's down, no one cares about it too much, we're probably going to move that aside. So we don't minimize, we minimize the impact of the pass ratio, for example. We obviously have a tiered base architecture. Uh, not all services are the same, although they are all uh, sons of the platform. They all live in the platform. Some of them are more critical than others. We want to package all of them together. They will work together. But some of them are more important. If the authorization server is down, you can't log in. That's not good. If your uh, log server is down, some admin in the customer side will not see a full stream of logs immediately. You're probably not even going to notice. So we have to balance these things. And we'll balance it at the platform level as well. Oh, uh, and when you're scaling, don't forget about your caches. Because if the intent of a cache is to absorb, like, say, 90% of the reads or something like that, and all of a sudden you have a lot more do uh, TPSs or requests, if you don't scale your caches, that means that you're probably not going to be holding 90%. And you grow your database, your data set will grow, but your cache will only stay the same. Don't do that, because that means that you're only attending for 20, 50, not the 90% of the whole volume that you are dealing with. So be mindful of that. They don't need to scale in the same order of proportion, but they still need to be scaled. What about service releases in the infrastructure operations? Well, again, we want to build a platform resilience, a any weatherproof kind of platform. We never want to be down. If we're down, we need to go back up as soon as we possibly can. And as we evolve services, we introduce bugs. Uh, as we grow in terms of load, we will need to make sure that we test for the different scenarios based on that. And as we deploy and scale our systems, we want to make sure that that particular operation does not affect our customers at any point. So we need to think about those. How do we deploy our platform? There's many different ways of doing it. We at all zero do a red-black. What is the red-black? Red-black is a, I got this um, quote from LinkedIn. Um, I thought that was very, very uh, useful because there's a lot of uh, confusion of what these actually mean. Sometimes folks refer to this as blue-green. We used to have blue-green. Uh, but there's a slight variation. In our interpretation of this, uh, uh, red-black is you have fully deployed clusters. One is having 100% of the load, and the other one is having zero. And then we flip it. Simple as that. Blue-green, in our deployment, it used to be something that we used to do. It would be that we would deploy both clusters at the same time, and we would be partially moving some portion of our traffic from one to another over an extended period of time. We don't do that anymore because we want to make sure we do clean cuts, and we have all the capacity up and running. That causes a little bit of a problem, especially for databases, because if you have injections of lots of connections all of a sudden, and you have two different clusters with the same capacity all bombarding the database, for example, we're going to see the problem of that in a second. But from a deployment perspective, we can catch up errors much, much faster, and we can flip them as well much, much faster. So from, a, from our perspective, doing this has a lot more benefits than slowly getting there. It, it, we would not see as many problems immediately when we used to work with the blue-green, red-black works a little bit best for us. So what does it mean? We have version zero of our platform, all the services packaged together, we deploy. Great, it's taking all 100% of our traffic. When we want to release a new version of the cluster, we build one up, sits there, does all the, passes all the checks, health checks, all that stuff, connects to the databases, does all that stuff, great. If everything goes OK, we flip it. And after a while, the black one goes away. The old one goes away. And that after a while can be hours or it can be days, depending on the criticality of the system and how comfortable we are with the changes, just FYI. Right, and if we need to do version 2, we just repeat the process. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. However, we have databases as a service, right? We do not deploy our databases in our cluster, so therefore they are not fully going through this life cycle in the same way. And what happens when you do that? And this is true for any of our databases, but in Postgres is one of them. 
So what happens is that we have a cluster that everything is bombarding the, the, um, the database at some point with all different instance sizes and capacity and whatnot. And this could be a problem. If we all of a sudden just put another cluster there that has exactly the same kind of load on top of the database, we can bring it down. So one thing that we quickly learned that we needed, not only because of this but for other reasons, is that PG Bouncer, it will help you. That's a bouncer for kids rocking. I've been a, a parent lately, so if you're not familiar with this, this is something you do when you become a parent. Anyways, PG Bouncer allows you to control a little bit more that flow, that storm of connections to resources like a Postgres instance or a Postgres cluster. And it allows us to also modulate a little bit better how these uh, deployment events actually affect the database or not. So it's a really, really good tool for that. We still have this offshoot kind of services that like to do their thing and like to go and hit the database directly. We're trying to kill them as much as possible because we don't like snowflakes, but they will still be there, so be mindful of those. So okay, we have a cluster, we have PG Bouncer, controls all that, and this is the point that you need to look into in terms of load to ensure that if you're doing a deployment, your database can handle it or not. If you have a new cluster, you're blank, when you bring it up, you also only need to look into PG Bouncer, actually. So this, this simplifies the operations from a deployment perspective quite radically, because now you know you don't need to figure out how many instances of each one of the services are going to be deployed. You need to understand what's the pool size of your uh, PG Bouncer and how many instances of PG Bouncer did you want. Again, we don't want to rely on a single node being failed. We want to be able to deploy these in a resilient uh, platform. All right. Then we have services resiliency. Many different services that we've seen before, and any of these can fail. In, in most cases, in our case in particular, this also happens, is that we have a service dependency at some point. Um, if one B here fails, the chain gets broken. If we don't want that, we just make it resilient and just uh, do it redundantly. However, this actually doesn't work because if B in one instance and C fails, you're still gonna have some flow that will not work. So what we typically do is a service mesh that any co container from any one of the services that have the dependency can talk to any other. So if any of them fails, you still have a route to process your requests. Might have some constrain, contra, uh, constraints somewhere down the chain, like a server gets overloaded and it starts having OOMs and all that stuff, but this allows you to have a safeguard against being fully down. That's great if you put Kubernetes on top of it, so the scaling magic, and voila, you have a fully resilient system, right? Mm. Anyways, it, it should work that way. That's all fine and dandy, but what about the things that we don't control, like your database as a service or your IS availability? Well, what do we do if the database is down or if the network is down? You do it redundantly, right? So you have secondary and read only. Uh, in, uh, in writers. If one goes down, fails over, great. However, this does not always work because there might be multiple fails at the same time. So building for your database not being there at all, it's important. Is what we call a degraded mode. And a degraded mode is something is, is the ability of the service to keep operating at the reduced capacity or with limited capabilities. Uh, it's not easy to identify, especially if you go into a very focus on this is the service and this is what it needs to do. He always needs to talk to the database. He's always going to assume that. Don't think about it this way. We live in a cloud environment where multiple instances might be up and down. Network errors are, exist. This is important to have this in mind when you're building it. So read-only, longer extended latency, or reduced set of fe features is something that you should ingrain in your development cycles to make sure that in case of failure, you're still going to be able to operate something. The other thing is we might have the question about should we have dedicated clusters or shared clusters for your databases? Again, you have your k server and everyone gets a database. This reminds me of that show where you go into a TV show and you get all your services around and you, know, you get a database and you get a database and everyone gets a database. It's great. Uh, if you go to this show. However, um, and obviously redundant, never forget about that, but uh, it might become with a price tag to it. So 
if you have a dedicated service, you know that your service will always have a Postgres instance to talk to, or two, of course, because you're doing it redundantly. So you don't care about a given service being down or not, because you know that it's an isolated piece of inf information. It's always going to be there. And you never do this, right? You never have a service that cross ch connects to a, directly to a different service database. You, you, you never do that, right? Or, or this, where multiple different services talk to you. Yes, we have those. Uh, makes me sad every day. And it is a problem for deploying these, especially at 600 plus capability. Because then you have a bunch of crosstalk between services and trying to figure point exactly which one is failing and why. It be, you're, basically, your, your chain of dependencies grew, right, uh, grew quite a lot. But not only that, some other problems happen. You're going to start having schema conflicts. Oh, you changed the column from bar shard to string now? What, 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 I, I wasn't aware of it. What's going on? I query your database, so why am I failing? Oh, you changed the index. Why? Now my queries are going to be slow. Uh, and then there's integration issues because some folks tested on some version of a schema that is not completely compliant with the latest schema that another team is working on. And obviously, don't forget, a minor non-critical service that has a dependency chain on a critical service that needs to read it from some, for something, if that fails, you also increase your blast radius. So it, you need to account for all these when you're doing this crosstalk. Don't do it if you can. So OK, uh, dedicated databases, great. Um, by the way, pop quiz. I talked to for long. What is the most common feature or attribute of a resilient system? Is it fault tolerant? Is it redundant? Or is it scalable? I'm going to give you no more time to think about it. It's none of them. It is expensive. That's what it is. So no matter. All of the three things that we talked about need to be there for a resilient system to be there. It needs to be fault tolerant, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be resilient. So once you have a deployment like this, you need to be considering the cost uh, effectiveness of this. We have different types of uh, deployments, platforms that serve just one customer or platforms that serve hundreds of thousands of them which we call multi-tenant application, uh, uh, multi-tenant or multi-subscriber uh, architecture, where the cost of doing this, and we still have this, unfortunately, we, the cost of doing this needs to be offset by the number of customers that you have paying for the service. Otherwise, it becomes very, very, very expensive very, very quickly to operate. I'm not even just talking about the instances themselves, or the fact that you can size them differently because of the needs that you, a given service might have. Not even talking about the EC2 bill. That will always come every month. That, that's as good as taxes. But I'm talking about the expensiveness of operating this. They become less standard deployments. Every one of them will be a little bit different. It will be less predictable to workload and testing and monitoring. And it requires more, a lot more fine tuning to adjust for those uh, customers. Again, if you have a single tenant customer, if that goes down, it's not going to be good, but you have one customer. If you have a space, or as we call it, where you have 500,000 customers, if that goes down, you're going to have 500,000 people yelling at you. So the scale of proportionality is, is quite considerable. So what's the alternative? Well, a big old database with all the databases on it, right? If everything goes down, everything goes down. No one complains. Uh, well, not really. So again, redundant as well. And won't this also cause similar problems as the cross database access between services? It will. Because on the picture that I've shown you before, all services talk to each other across different databases and whatnot. In this case, everything talks to the same place. So that's a single point of failure, even if you have redundancy on it. So how do you manage that? Well, you know, uh, you're still going to have this, but in a much more easy way. Because you're going to have the bouncers in front of it. And again, this also allows you to modulate a little bit the access to the databases. It's not perfect. You're still going to have issues about, you know, you know, this service is talking to two different databases at the same time, but in the same cluster. But you can control that a little bit more effectively. 
PG Bouncer, I have to admit, it's it, it grown on me. I used to hate it. Uh, why? Because if you if anything is between my service and my database, I think it's a waste of uh, space and time and processing power. However, given that uh, that Postgres has a limited amount of connections that you can establish, it is important to safeguard your database. It, your database needs to be protected. PG Bouncer is a shiny armor that allows you to protect your database, so make use of that. Dedicated per workload type, so we have a, a PG Bouncer for reads, we have one for reads and writes. Good for load control, helps scaling during strikes. And it's also you working as a shock observer for high speed loads. So, or even rotation of nodes, for example. It allows you to minimize the impact of a failover, which is good. Basically because it adds up delays and no one really knows what's going on between page balancer and database, so it's fine. So, but from a large perspective, it's a good piece of hardware to have there, like a shock observer, so you have a more smoother ride. All right, so shared uh, clusters for the win, right? So we should always have a shared, um, a shared cluster. Well, we have rules as well for those. Uh, dedicated, it's good for service allocation, segregation of data sets, increases databases node footprint, obviously, you're gonna have more nodes. Um, also cost per unit of processing that you need to spread out some way between your customers. Uh, and it's great for us in the multi-tenant deployment. Shared, uh, simple deployment, only one database, redundant, great. Has increased blast radius. Uh, it's easier to roll out changes like upgrades and whatnot or patches. Suffers from noisy neighbors. If you have a database that's larger than others, has more access than others, other servers will be affected by it. And it's our preferred deployment for single tenant deployments. What do we actually do when we are at scale, very large systems, is that we have a mix of both. So we would typically say that all databases will go to one particular cluster, that's all fine. But in some cases, either because they are noisier or because they have different retention policies, or because they do need that extra capacity just for the system to operate, we will just provision those databases as there for them. And we do this on a tier base. So if you are in a particular tier, you're gonna have more than one database. If you are in a lower tier, you're gonna have all your own one. So the rules are shared clusters, similar life cycle, same backup retention, same service criticality. You can have a database just for you, and it's the default. A dedicated, dedicated cluster is for demanding workloads, so we move the noisy folk away. We address scaling needs as needed. We limit resource starvation by single service, and we do it at scale out, cost effective. The slides will be available later, uh, if I cut you off during the, the, the photo. All right, database management at scale. There's a laundry list, and you've probably been in sessions that talk to you about a bunch of different problems. Uh, I admit I have a, um, a personal uh, hate for triggers and store procedures. I think they are uh, pieces. The devil injected those in our live stream. So, but anyways, that's just me. There's a bunch of things here that you've probably already seen across the years or blog posts and whatnot, the folks talking about those things. But I want to focus on things that are probably not as uh, common. Single versus multi-tenant and the indexes that we might have on them. Auditing rules, because we are a highly um, regulated environment, we operate in that and we need to have auditing, and we are a security company, and Postgres schemas. Don't forget, databases problems manifest themselves at unexpected ways. Everything is going smoothly until it isn't. And it is only a couple of bytes that trigger some cascading effect that just brings down your system. Let's look into a simple example. You have an um, assets table, bunch of few, uh, columns, I won't name them all, but they have ID, asset ID, name, options, and tenant name. The focus here is tenant name. Um, if I have these three indexes, two of them start with tenant name, which is Fine, I guess, right? It's the most common use access pattern for the system. So if I look into the cardinality of that value, and obviously the keys of the indexes that be going to be created on top of that value, if I have a single tenant, every single tenant has the same one. If I have a multi-tenant, that will be spread out. Those two indexes will have a completely different profile, performance profile at scale, once you deploy them. 
we don't want to have different indexes for multi-tenant and single tenant. We just want to have a single database that we manage. Again, I said it before, I'm lazy. I don't want to think about this too much. However, we need to think about them. Because different indexes with cardinality will have impacts on usage. They will have a different vacuum profile as well. Vacuum will operate differently on indexes that have a large cardinality of data that never changes from ones that do change constantly and have a high cardinality as well. And bloat will also be affected by the cardinality, not only just the workload. So be mindful of those. I also want to talk to you about the crown, corn of horns, the crown of horns, sorry. Uh, what is that? Well, that's a spike that happens regularly. Is DB auditing a free lunch? And I'm going faster because I've been given the sign. Yes, it does not give you a free lunch because that process there that you're seeing, those spikes that can cause you to trigger a meltdown on your database, are basically a trigger, go figure, that exports logs, audit logs, via foreign data raptor of the audit logs to a S3 bucket. And why do they cause this problem? Or what, is this a problem? It is definitely a problem because you either have to increase the capacity of the system, and this only manifests itself actually at very large, high, low TPS. So if you do not want to have these spiky things that can go off shoot all of a sudden, you need to very well control the way that your store procedures are tested at scale, something that we are not very uh, good at doing. No such thing as free lunch. Recurrent internal DB processes need to be checked. That's why I don't really like them. They are harder to test. Move all your non-operational workloads outside of the DB. Forget about the triggers that function create in certain. Just do that on the client. It's much easier. And test triggers and start procedures at scale. Schemas. Last thing. I'm going to be very, very fast. The good folks from Neon have a very good blog post explaining what the schemas are. But basically, our named collections of database objects. So a view of your database where it comprises all the objects that you need define in your namespace, on your schema. You have a database, you have some tables on it, you have some views of those tables, and you might have a function or two there. Again, I love you. You might have a schema one, and you might have a schema two. All different database objects need to belong to a schema. If you don't define one, it will be public, which I would not recommend you to use it. All right, so why are these valuable at scale? You can have an app schema, and you have different schemas for your extensions. Why is this valuable? If you put everything in public, if you want to migrate, you need to migrate everything. If you're doing, for example, the exercise of upgrading your Postgres instance from, let's say, PG-11, you, you might have one. You, you, actually, you, you're cool guy. No one here has PG-11 running, right? It's no one. Not like 650 of them. No, no, no one will have that. Oh, actually, we don't, we don't have that many. Anyways, we, we might or may not have a PG-11. Again, safe harbor. And we might or may not want to uh, do a PG-16 um, upgrade. If we have a separate, we can completely forget about extension schema and just move the application schema. This is a minute thing that might be related. Well, PG schemas are just there for you know, better managing the access pattern to it or the security controls or if they are visible in the search path or not. No, this is our very valuable as well for doing the database migrations, especially in CDC. You create a CDC on, that, on top of that schema that only sees that schema and that schema alone, and you are safeguarded for any other stuff that might happen on your database in terms of extensions, functions that are not controlled, and stuff like that, that can break your CDC very quickly. Keep permissions isolated, allow for simpler CDC, and the worst thing I ever said yes to of not having. So I do regret it till today. Quick recap, yes, it's just a login page. Uh, we have a tiered based architecture where we favor some uh, service instead of others. We do multiple redundancy levels. We want to, we want to be able to be up, the, uh, up and running all the time and if a failure comes, we need to be able to recover. PG Bouncer saves the day. I used to hate it, now I love it. Audit logs, there's no such thing as free, free lunch. Check your internal process, check your triggers. And the good folks from the conference tell me to give me the feedback if you want to see more of these in the future. If not, uh, it's time for coffee. I do not give me any time for questions, but I'll be around. You have some time? Okay, I have some time. Okay, cool.
And that's it. We have one question here. Considering the foreign data wrapper export spikes, uh, have you considered uh, using a, a replica to handle that kind of load? Since they are audit logs, you actually want the audit logs on both the primary writer node and the secondary as well, because what you want to do is make sure that whoever has been doing that query or that access is logged and audited, so our DNR uh, team is able to parse those logs and say, oh, this is a strange access going on. So that, we could move it, but the audit logs belong to the logs of the node that they are running on, so there's no escape from that. You need to parse them there. Another question here. Yes. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I have a question regarding the blast radius that you spoke about. Have you observed a case where one instance crashes like its own database and then it affects the others in the multi-tenant scenario? And how do you protect against such scenarios? Thank I you. go to the product team that build the query that talk to the database that shouldn't and tell them, look, folks, you need to think about how do you re you cannot have a hard a dependency on a database that you don't control. Sometimes what you need to do is expose that query that you're doing via a service of the service owner of that database so you can control and modulate that. But having direct connections might cause those. So a small service that is not critical to your flow might cause you to be down. We had that in the past. We still have some tolerance to that. And the way to mitigate that is to make sure that any service that needs it always talk to a replica, for example. So even if there's a failover, there's still going to be have some read-only capacity to be done. If you need to write, I'll be mad with them, really mad, because they should be talking to a service, not directly to the database. Hi, um, my question is regarding the, uh, as you mentioned uh, previously, with uh, regards to deploying a new cluster, uh, wherein the, sp uh, the way you manage the spikes is via the PG bouncer. How does it work with the application side connection poolers, and do you uh, require them or enforce something on their side to be able to run like in degraded mode so that um, when you control the connections on the PG bouncer side, they should be still be able to you know, function properly while uh, the deployment is happening. So you, you're saying that, if I got your question correctly, you have two deployments, PG Bouncer is up and running. How do we modulate which uh, the access to the database? Is that what you're saying? Or? Uh, yeah, but, uh, but my, the exact question is that, um, how does it work with the uh, application side connection pooler? Because um, there should be a, uh, I mean, a way to actually manage it on the application side, right? And then you're also managing the connections on the database side by a PG bouncer. So how do they work together? Or do you, uh, are the applications still able to function if you, for, for example, limit the connections that they generate during the, 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 the spike in the connections? Let me explain a, a little very, very important detail about the architecture that I did not talk to. Every time we deploy a new cluster, a completely different set of users are deployed as well. So for each application that we deploy on cluster red and cluster black, they do not share any credentials. So every time we deploy, a new set of users get created. And then we do it precisely because of security concerns and to make sure that those clusters are completely isolated. Now, how we control the connection pool, that's all done at the configuration of the PG bouncer. The passover of the credentials are done both ways and all that stuff. So, and we expose to the services only PG bouncer connection strings. So they connect to PG bouncer and PG bouncer connects to uh, the database. However, for each one of those services, they will have their own dedicated user that only has access to the resources they need. And for each cluster that we deploy, we always rotate all of the users all the time. So we always make sure that they are rotated. How do we rotate it? We remove the login from the users after the cluster is no longer there. So they're no longer able to access. And we have a burning uh, script that will eventually delete those users. But those users are completely isolated. So there's no so funky thing like, oh, there's leak. Uh, this cluster got leaked. We just delete and create a new one. Simple. Does that make? Awesome. So thank you so much, Nobeto, once more for the awesome talk. Thanks for the uh, audience questions, participation. Coffee time, 30 minutes. Uh, if you're coming here again, it's at 11.50. Thank you once more. Thank you.